How many changes in the LDS temple ceremony are needed before God gets it right? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files, and this will be probably our last visit with Danny Larson. I appreciate you coming and sharing. You, this has really been fun, and yeah, been fun. I hope informative for people. Uh, we've covered a lot of topics, and we're looking at our notes, so sorry about that. But uh, And a couple of other things. If You've probably seen phone calls come up on the screen, and you're welcome to call either one of us for any details or if you want to just discuss or challenge, I guess, anything that we've discussed, uh, feel free to do that. I'd also like to give a shout out to utlm.org, mrm.org, and irr.com for reference material that I've used. I guess Danny, you may have used them too. They're just excellent resources, uh, Mormonism, Shadow and Reality, and uh, in their own words is really one Bill McKeever does. Mm -hmm. It's just so good. Yeah. And uh, so I think that was all of our little notes here. So we've got an interesting topic, Danny. Blacks yeah. and the priesthood. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, one that the LDS Church is, wishes they had never come up in their church history. <laughs> but uh, it all begins with a war in heaven. That's their doctrine. That's they true, teach that. Isn't it? That in heaven there the follower there were the followers of Jesus and there were the followers of Lucifer, and there was this war that took place and those that were fence sitters or neutral in this war were considered less valiant, and they were the spirits uh, who would receive bodies of a dark skin, and so when it played out was on earth when Cain because he killed his brother Abel became the father of an inferior race. This is according to Mormonism, right. thus establishing the lineage for this less valiant spirits to come to earth. And so the curse of the black skin had prevented millions of souls from the privilege of the Mormon priesthood and the temple blessings for decades uh, when the church was restored through Joseph Smith. Um, and it was such an important doctrine to the church that they kept the anybody of color out of their priesthood and out of the temples that um, Brigham Young, even in the Journal of Discourses, volume 10, verse 1, or uh, page 110, uh, quotes, Shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? <laughs> if the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. Okay, this is coming, prophet of God. This is coming from a prophet of God. And then in General Conference in 1882, Brigham Young announced a policy restricting black men from priesthood ordination. He said, quote, That curse will remain upon them, and they never can hold the priesthood or share in it until all the other descendants of Adam have received the promises and enjoyed the blessings of the priesthood and the keys thereof. So that was taught for 120 years, right? Yeah. Well, in June of eight, 1978, yeah. the current president of the church, Spencer W. Kimball, had a, re a revelation lifting this ban of the priesthood on, on blacks. And at the end of our doctrine, uh, their do doctrine and covenants is a statement known as the official declaration number two, right. announcing the lift of this priesthood ban. Now, you can go to the to the gospel topic essays like we talked about before, yeah. and in 2000, 2013 there was one released calling itself the race and the priesthood, and so this gives the impression if you read that 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 essay that the reason why the blacks couldn't hold the priesthood for 120 years was because of the prejudices the prejudiced views of the men in the 1800s towards black people. And so it wasn't... So it was a cultural, social kind that's, of That's thing. right, exactly. Today they call this doctrine uh, that Brigham Young was preaching from the Temple Square folklore. Yeah. And they're trying to downplay it and say, no, that was not a policy, it's not doctrine. And yet they needed a revelation to change the folklore. That's a good point. You know, so, um, I don't know. I, it's just a horrible... It's it part of hit their history that they can't run away from. No. They have to face. It's right there. So, Kind of like polygamy. Yeah, exactly. We're just stuck with it. 
Well, the next one is the Book of Mormon, and it's, it, it's just some of the changes. You mentioned a number of them, but I wanted to point out just one thing. Joseph Smith wrote a letter to Oliver Cowdery back in uh, 1829, and he wrote this, and, and I'm just a, a sentence out of it, does not know certain that he can get it, the money, but is a going to try, a going to try. Well, the 1830 Book of Mormon contains at least nine of these little phrases, a journeying, a going, a preaching, a begging, a preparing, a possession, a coming, and a marching. Just a little idiosyncrasy of Joseph Smith or maybe the times. I don't think God talks that way. No, probably not. And so uh, to have this a going yeah. in the Oliver Cowdery letter and then to find these same things in the Book of Mormon kind of makes you think what a, coincidence. a little bit. Yeah. But the last part of that I wanted to cover, um, not so much in changes, but back around 1000 BC, Leif Eric, uh, no, 1000 AD, I'm sorry, Leif Erikson. Uh, uh, I believe, comes to Newfoundland. And for a hundred to, they're not sure, speculate, a hundred to two or three hundred years, these Vikings are there in Newfoundland. They don't really go anywhere else that they've found, but they're there and have a settlement. You can go in and they've found from infrared from the satellites, they found actual things there at the site, mm. all kinds of archaeology showing and proving that the uh, the Vikings visited that little spot for a hundred or a couple of hundred years. Here we have a Book of Mormon with a thousand year, actually almost what, 2,500 year history if you include the Jaredites, and millions of people apparently yeah. that lived on the American continent and there's absolutely no history. No trace. No trace of that, <laughs> no archaeology at all. A little scary. Yeah. Okay, well that kind of ties in a little bit with the seer stone and the face in the hat. That's our next topic. <laughs> Never heard of that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, the LDS Church has always denied that Joseph Smith used a seer stone or a peep stone in the translation of the Book of Mormon. All the pictures that I ever grew up yeah, with in the had church. Yeah, had the plates right there. The, the plates were sitting on the table just like this and Joseph Smith was running his finger across the plates and he was translating e Reformed Egyptian into English while his scribe sat on the other side of the of the table and wrote them down and he wouldn't go any further than tell he had the scribe re repeat what he had just said. Well we know that and also that with the plates in the box in, on Hill Cumorah where Joseph Smith had received them from from the angel Moroni were a set of, uh, of what they called uh, yeah. instruments they called Urim and Thummim. Yeah, the they were to be used, the interpreters. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now the church has finally admitted that he didn't use, he didn't translate word for word by vision uh, uh, using the plates physically, that he actually put this seer stone that he found when he dug up in a well, uh, he put it inside of his hat and put it up to his face so that he could block out the light and then he would see the words actually appear on the seer stone and he would use those words um, to have those written down and yeah. to be part of the Book of Mormon. So, And the same seer stone that he used to uh to try to find golden buried, yeah. buried treasure, right? right. Yeah. So, um, if you want to go to Gospel Topic Essays titled The Book of Mormon Translation, you'll find their admittance of uh, that, that he did use the seer stone, which they do have in possession down at head, church headquarters today. I believe it's in, the pres in President Nelson's actual office that they have, he has a, the seer stone. And they have released a picture yeah, of that. There's actually a couple of them. Yeah, there, there was a white stone yeah. and there was a stark stone. Grant Palmer, I remember saying something about seeing those years and years ago when he was a student at BYU. Oh, wow. and, yeah, he had seen those, but they weren't public and certainly. And you wonder why all, this, all the effort killing uh, Laban and making sure that Mormon and Moroni carried yeah. these plates around and preserved them and all that stuff if he didn't even bother using them. I think Joseph Smith started out with these plates, covered up all the time so nobody could see them, and then he just got weary and tired of using that as his prop, and so he just decided to put his peep stone in a hat, and that was much easier and more portable yeah. for him to go about the translation. And who made those plates, I guess. Yeah. Well, the next one I have here is, it's kind of a big one in a way. It's uh, the Journal of Discourses and the, the Mormon Doctrine and uh, miracle, miracle of Forgiveness. It just seems like a current prophet always supersedes all the other prophets. Right. 
And so to discount Bruce R. McConkie now is just very commonplace, or Spencer W. Kimball, or Brigham Young, like we've talked about. They don't publish the Journal of Discourses, as far as I know. I don't know that you can go out and buy. You have to go buy an You can old go one. online and find them. Yeah. I mean, in the... And old ones, yeah. right? Well, you already quoted one, but I've got one quote here, actually two quotes of Boy K. Packer. He says, I have a hard time with historians because they idolize the truth. The truth is not uplifting. It destroys. History, historians should only tell that part of the truth that is inspiring and uplifting. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And then this one, and you may have quoted this one, some things that are true aren't very useful. Some things that are totally honest some think that to be totally honest, they have to tell everything. Goodness, they don't. If they got the mindset for that, then they're always grumbling that they have an appetite for it. It really isn't productive. It doesn't really make anybody happy. And I've, I asked uh, my good friend Jim Catlin, who runs all this stuff, to do a, a little thing, a little screen on the Living Christ document from the year 2000. He put this together, and I really appreciate it. And it really struck me because we read this, we declare in words of solemnity that his priesthood and his church have been restored upon the earth, built upon the foundation of dot, 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 apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the corner, chief cornerstone. If you go back and read Ephesians 2.20, the dot, dot, dot represents the word the, which I think probably takes up about the same space as the dot, dot, dot. But if you think about it, build upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now you're talking about Peter and Paul, or Peter and James and John and the, the original, mm -hmm. and the prophets of the Old Testament, certainly. But instead, leaving out that, it makes it sound like apostles and prophets are supposed to be around now. Yeah, so ongoing. It's just interesting yeah. uh, that they would make that subtle little change, as we talked about, not really telling the whole truth or making it a half-truth. Anyway, next one. Okay. Uh, recent changes by President Nelson. Now, we know that he has stated that the restoration is ongoing, yeah. which I thought it had already been restored, the church, <laughs> right? But right. no, it's continuing to be restored. Yeah. So a lot of changes going on in the, in the church today, particularly in, since he's been the president of the church. Right. Um, and a lot of these changes are nothing more than administrative decisions. They're not really revelations. Right. Just, to, just to mention a few, uh, the focus on the proper name of the church. Uh, Two-hour services changed from three hours. Uh, the youth programs changing and dropping scouting. Uh, changes in the elders and high priest quorum structure. The new curriculums, new temples always being announced. The changes in the temple ceremonies and endowments and initiatory work. Changes to the missionary age. Changes to uh, missionary dress for women. Uh, changes to missionaries being able to video conference with family weekly. Changes uh, to the youth the temple youth participation age. Yeah. And uh, they're go they go on and on, but there's just so many home teaching being changed to ministry and ministering and women praying in, in general conference now. Yeah. Uh, changes to general conference schedules and um, changes to ward mission leaders. And the policy that came out in the two 2015 of the LBGQT yeah. um, parents said, uh, and, and then, all being, and then being changed, being changed again. by revelation again, just three yeah. and a half years later. <laughs> um, the revised temple recommend questions. Uh, there's just so many of them that it's yeah. hard to. to and women them now all. being able to witness uh, baptisms. I really think it's a desperate effort on behalf of the church to try to make it more, um, a little more easy for people to go to church and to stay active. And uh, to be and to, to attract Christians and to attract Christians, yeah. Because now they don't have home teaching, exactly. they have ministering. So, well, I wonder when they're going to adopt the cross. That would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> hey, the next one is, um, and this is kind of a thing that I think we all sensed in this becoming new creatures and seeing Jesus for a different difference and re resting on Him and His work. Even though we still love God, we love our fellow man, and we serve very faithfully to other people. Because we love them, you do that for a wife if you love her, uh, you, you love people. But um, with that comes a freedom that I never felt before as a Mormon. Um, I used to be very judgmental and have a pride mm -hmm. that I was going to the celestial kingdom, that other people weren't if they weren't 
if they were drinking coffee or having a smoke or any, you know, had a tattoo or anything that, <laughs> very judgmental. And I feel that's one of the blessings that's come to me is the freedom. And a lot of people that I interview feel that same, yeah. same thing. Do you feel that? Too? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's that changed heart again. Yeah. You know. We don't and judge just, people. Yeah, and just we all have our own issues to deal with. We don't have to yeah. look at other people. And we're and sinners, and we're all that? sinners. I didn't know that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I wasn't perfect, but I, I didn't know I was. I a thought sinner. you always were. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> okay, the virgin birth. Um, well, okay. Well, the church teaches the LDS church teaches that Jesus is the literal offspring of Mary and God, and uh, who are Jesus's physical parents. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I didn't one know being that. his immortal father. And the other being his mortal mother, right? Yeah. So, um, Mormonism denies that status uh, uh, of Mary as a virgin in that case. Because God the Father was actually the Savior's literal yeah. father. Yeah. Okay, so, it also denies that he was begotten of the Holy Ghost. And Brigham Young in Journal Discourses, uh, Volume 1, ver uh, Chapter... Volume 1, page 50 through 51, he says, quote, When the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the Father had begotten him in his own likeness. He was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And who is the Father? He is the first of the human family. Jesus, our elder brother, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our Father in heaven. Now remember, from this time forth and forever, that Jesus Christ was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. Now that creature or that character that he was talking about that was in the garden. Yeah. Okay. He's really later on. We'll talk about it. But that, he's speaking of Adam. It. Yeah. <laughs> You're so, going to talk about that, I think. The Adam okay. God. We know that as Christians, we believe that the conception was a miraculous, uh, creative power uh, yeah. by the Holy Spirit. And so in Matthew chapter one, verse eighteen. It says, quote, Now the birth of, the Jesus, of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Mm. And then the Book of Mormon also says the same thing. And so, again, this is before you know, Joseph Smith had changed, changed his theology. His <laughs> but in Alma chapter 7, verse 10, it says, quote, And behold, he shall be born of Mary at Jerusalem, which is in the land, is the land of our forefathers, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who was, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. So that verse conflicts with Brigham Young's statement that... And with typical Mormon teaching, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, next one, blood atonement. I guess this is a big topic, but um, it's interesting that uh, up until 1990, in the temple... You made covenants that if you divulge those covenants, that you could have your life taken, and we all demonstrated those yeah. in the temple. You went through them before 1990, right? So here's a couple of quick quotes. Brigham Young taught: There are sins that men commit for which they cannot receive forgiveness in this world or in the world to come, and if they had their eyes open to see their true condition, they would be perfectly willing to have their blood spilt upon the ground. I know when you hear my brethren telling about cutting people off from the earth that you consider it as strong doctrine, but it is to save them, not to destroy them. And Brigham Young also said, it is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins through the fall and those committed by men, yet men can commit sin which it can never repair. Wow. So Jesus didn't do all he should have. He, you yeah. know, we have to he do our own shed sins, blood. No. And I always thought it was interesting that we, we revere Moses and Paul pretty much, but David gets a... Uh, kind of gets it because he was involved with Bath, Bathsheba, but Moses actually killed an Egyptian, and Paul was there when Stephen was stoned. stoned so yeah. uh, curious. Anyway, okay. go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the next uh, topic is a prophets, apostles, the continuation of those, and then failed prophecy. So I'm going to talk about those two. Um, we know that in the Old Testament, the prophets were God's mouthpiece to the people. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John, the John the Baptist. Yeah. So he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. And the New Testament apostles were never called prophets. Um, they were witnesses, special witnesses to his life, death, and resurrection, all right? 
Yeah. Okay. Now, on the Mount of Transfiguration, we talked about this earlier, that Jesus took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount so that he, they could visualize or see him being trans, transfigured before them. And during that time, Moses and Elijah appeared in that vision. And Peter, James, and John was watching all this. They weren't participating or talking to them, but they were watching this happen. Uh, there was a conversation going on between uh, Elijah, Moses, and, and Christ on that mount. And then a cloud covered over him. And when the cloud lifted up, Elijah and Moses were gone. Now, Elijah represented the prophets. Moses represented the law. And I think this was a demonstration to Peter, James, and John that it was Jesus Christ that they were to look to and follow, not the law Because all of a sudden, the other two were gone. Exactly. Right? No yeah. more prophets, no more laws. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets, right? Yeah. That's what that meant. So, um, That's excellent. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about failed prophecies. Um, we know that in the Doctrine and Covenants, you can find many failed prophecies. Now, yet... Uh, in D&C, section 1, verse 37, Joseph Smith wrote, Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. <laughs> but out of those 50, many of them weren't. Um, yeah. And Jesus warned about false prophets who would speak in his name, and he gave us a way to test whether a man uh, was a true prophet or not. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So, also I just want to read one more uh, verse in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that he shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. So mm -hmm. pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty strong heavy. language. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think we can really trust anything that Joseph Smith said because he, had his, his prophecies. prophecies had, yeah, had failed. Yeah. Well, I've got one quick one here. Missionary work. Again, back to Christian values. I didn't know that they did missionary work and yet they send out missionary teams even people go out on full-time missions and spend years most many many years of their yeah. life serving other people and and going out and do missionary work i just had no clue that <laughs> i mean i knew about jehovah's witnesses but i didn't know that christians were so actively involved in evangelizing and missionary work throughout the world and they've been doing this ever since i mean that's uh, you know, very historical, all the work yeah. that they did. So yeah. that's quick, but you know, the, Christians definitely do missionary work. Spend a lot of money and time doing it. So and take their families with them. You know, Many they do a times. lot of humanitarian work yeah. and at the risk of their own lives as, yeah. as well. So now you've got a really important one here. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Adam God theory. Yeah, you um, touched it on a little bit yeah. there, but it used to be called doctrine. But, you know... Oh, is it? No, know, it's a theory? Yeah. We, well, we, did, we always heard it as a theory, right? The Adam-God theory? Yeah. But it really started out as a doctrine. Um, we know that Brigham Young first taught it at General Conference in 1852. <laughs> uh, although it has been rejected by the church today, um, it's still accepted in thrown a lot under, of the... Thrown under the bus. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> but more, a, a lot of the Mormon fundamentalist groups still believe in, oh, sure. uh, in uh, the um, Adam-God doctrine. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brigham Young taught in Journal of Discourses that uh, Adam is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Now, let me just sort of give you a summary of how this doctrine starts and how it kind of muddles and then <laughs> why they taught it. So Adam was once a mortal man who became resurrected and exalted on another planet. He then became as Michael to earth. Adam brought Eve, one of his wives, with him where they became mortal by eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Now where are you reading this from? This is, I'm just, I'm just summarizing what the, okay. what the Adam God doctrine taught. Okay. Okay. This is actually what it taught, but I'm summarizing it. After bearing mortal children and establishing the human race, Adam and Eve return to their heavenly thrones where Adam serves as God, the father of both the spirits and the physical bodies of all human beings. 
Later, Adam returned to the earth to become the literal father of Jesus. We already read about that. Oh. This was all taught in the endowment ceremony up to the early 20th century. Wow. That's what they learned when they went into the temple. After Brigham died, the more traditional story of Adam and Eve replaced the Adam-God doctrine. Now, we know that President Spencer W. Kimball in 18, or 1976 took a stand about this doctrine because people were still talking about, yeah. it. was it a doctrine or do we believe this? And yeah. so he wanted to it's... clarify the church's stance on it. So he said, quote, We warn you against the dissemination of doctrines which are not according to the scriptures and which are alleged to have been taught by some of the general authorities of past generations. General authorities, including not the prophet, <laughs> yeah, all who these, would never lead us astray. All the prophets up to Spencer W. Kimball in 1976 We're taught stuck with this. The, the, yeah, the yeah. Adam-God theory. Such, for instance, is the Adam-God theory. We denounce that theory and hope that everyone will be, ca will be cautioned against this and other kinds of false doctrines. So that's one false prophet calling another prophet false. False. Yeah. <laughs> so that was it. Okay. That was thank it. you. Well, we're gonna have to cut our little thing a little short here. I just mentioned the words Kinderhook plates real quickly. The plates in, and I do have a thing. This is what Joseph Smith said. I insert facsimiles of the six brass plates found near Kinderhook. I've translated a portion of them and find they contain the history of, the per, of a person with whom they were found. He was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. Well, uh, William Fugate admitted later that it was a hoax, that he'd used acid and it was a 19th century production. And an article in the eight, August 1981 ensign of the church entitled, Kinderhook plates brought to Joseph Smith appear to be a 19th century hoax. So you can look that one up, the Kinderhook plates. Yeah, so he, Joseph Smith used uh, the Book of Abraham. It turned out to be a fail. Yeah. And the Kinderhook plates turned out to be a fail. <laughs> And you know, the Book of uh, Mormon's in question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Book yeah. of Mormon, if those failed, then, you know, what about the reliability of the Book of Mormon being yeah. a, a true translation? Now, we've actually run out of time, and so I'm going to throw sure. it to you. If you've got one here that you really want to cover, I guess we've only got two left. If you want, can really cover the. Well. You know, I just want to just want to encourage people who are watching these shows to. Um, to do your own research, the to study plenty of information out yeah. there. You mentioned some. Don't websites. be afraid to study your faith. Exactly. Yeah. You know, there's no fear in examination. Well, of it says the, truth. the glory of God is intelligence. Yeah. So study, think a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think it just uh, you know once you start down that rabbit hole, though, yeah. you'll find that it's just um, so obvious that what the LDS Church has taught and presents today is another gospel yeah. and not the gospel of Jesus Christ, unfortunately. Well, let me wrap up. Thank you, Danny. That okay. was excellent. Thanks for your help with this I one. I'm going to wrap up just a little bit with this changes in the temple. That's kind of how I started this one. I figured we'd get to it. But if you think about the temple changes that have been done, they had blood oaths all the way through it. You were, had a vengeance, vengeance oath that they used to do for Joseph Smith and his martyrdom. Um, they used to have polygamy in there, wife and wives that stand by each other as they were married. Uh, they used to actually seal men to men. It was called the law of adoption. And I just, again, how long does it take? How many changes does it take for God to get the temple ceremony right? <laughs> You know, and when I went through in 1990, I was doing all these ways of killing myself, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Yeah. I kind of joked to myself, I guess I'm going to have to tell the angels as I pass by them. Now, I went before 1990, so I, you know, I have to do it this <laughs> way. I never thought about and that. And those that come after 1990, yeah. they, don't, they won't know those things, so they may not be accepted in, but, you know, you tell the angels there. Yeah. Anyway, I just... Uh, it kind of became a domino effect for me. Did did it for you? Yeah. Oh, did certainly. You? Yeah. It it did. Once I yeah, it just starts like 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 a house of cards. It just starts to fold in, yeah. and then you're like, oh my gosh. And once you can be brave enough to kind of back up and just look at the perspective, 
Yeah. And, and I actually think of what it is. Because everybody has a shelf, apparently. Most mm -hmm. Mormons say when they come in yeah. and be interviewed, well, I had a shelf, and I kept piling this stuff on. Let me just say this. When people leave, when they finally come to the realiza realization that they have been deceived or uh, that it's not true, they are so upset and angry that they, they leave the church, and then what they do is they throw Jesus out with the bathwater. I'm so glad you brought and that it's up. And so, it's so sad to see the people that do. Um, and you wonder, what have we taught them in Mormonism that they would leave that Jesus behind? That they would behind? just leave Jesus. The thing I try to tell people is that it was God that was bringing you to the truth. So don't turn your back on him and don't deny that, that uh, his son paid for your sins and that you can have eternal life you know, through belief on him. Because that's all you need. Jesus is enough. And so it's a blessing to him, but at the same time, it's, it's traumatic yeah, no, and it's, it's hard. hard. It's hard it's to just, see people. Yeah. yeah. So I encourage everybody to just continue to have your faith and trust in God that he is guiding you along this path to truth and light. That's so excellent. And, and for me, trust the Bible and read yes. it. John, Romans, Hebrews, some of those letters of Paul They're amazing. are just wonderful. Yeah. And they really preach that gospel, of what Jesus did and we couldn't do for ourselves. Exactly. Thanks, Annie. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh -huh. And we'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files.